Let's finish out chapter 10 by taking a look at the first isomorphism theorem. This theorem tells us that we're going to let phi be a homomorphism from G to G bar. Then we're going to have a mapping from G mod the kernel of phi to phi of G given by G kernel phi maps to phi of G is an isomorphism. So that's a lot of phi's and g's and kernels, and it might be a little bit confusing. So I think it makes more sense with a concrete example. So that's what we're going to look at here. So really, we're just looking at taking g, and we're looking at how to divide it into a smaller group, right? That's what a factor group does, which is what we're dealing with here. This is a factor group or a quotient group. And that's the same with phi of g. So we're basically saying that those two smaller groups are going to be isomorphic to one another. So we're going to look at this example where we have phi maps z to z4. So g in this case is the integers. So negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So we're going to map that group to Z4. And of course we know Z4, which is G bar, is 0, 1, 2, 3. So the mapping phi is given by phi of x is equal to x mod 4. So what is phi of g? Now I want you to note that phi of g doesn't have to be everything in g bar. So if you need an example where phi of g is not the same as g bar, you can look in your textbook on page 201. They have an example dealing with d4, the dihedral group, um, where obviously it's going to map from d4 to d4, but phi of g or phi of d4 is not going to be the entire group. But in this case, I guess I kind of let the cat out of the bag before we went through it. In this case, if I'm looking at phi of g, I know that if I take, say, phi of negative 4, I would get 0. Or if I took phi of 0, I would get 0, because these are all the values that give me 0 mod 4. And I could get 1 by taking negative 3 or 1 or 5 or so on. Or I could get 2 because negative 2 mod 4 or 2 mod 4 or 6 mod 4, that's all going to give me 2. Or I could get 3, negative 1, 3, so on. Those are all going to give me 3 mod 4. So as I said, in this case, phi of g is actually the same as g bar. It's actually the same as our group that's being mapped to, but it doesn't have to be all of the elements of g bar. So that means on our picture here we have g, which is all of the integers, and g is being mapped kind of to a smaller group. So we're, be, we're collapsing the group into 0, 1, 2, and 3. So what this first isomorphism theorem says is we're going to collapse it into another group, another smaller group, and those two groups are going to be isomorphic. They're going to have the same number of elements and they're going to behave in the same way. So let's take a look. We want to find g mod the kernel of phi. So of course first we have to find the kernel of phi. So what are the elements of g that will map to the identity of phi? Well, the identity of phi of g is 0. So what elements of g map to 0? Well, we've already kind of talked about negative 4 and 0 and 4 and 8 and so on. So really, we're looking at multiples of 4, which we're going to write as the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. So now what we want to do is find those factor groups, the factor groups made by g mod the kernel of phi. So we're taking g, that's our group here, and we're dividing it by the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. So obviously one of our groups is just going to be 
the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. That's going to give me 4 and 0 and negative 4. And then I'll have 1 plus the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. That's going to give me the negative 3 and the 1 and the 5. And then I'll have 2 plus the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. So that's 2, negative 2, and 2, and 6, and so on. And then we have 3 plus the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. And hopefully already you're seeing how these are kind of behaving in the same way. But this is the group G mod the kernel of phi. So those are those factor groups, those, those cosets. So we can see right away that these two groups both have four elements. And now we just have to say, well, how do they map to one another? Well, we can see that this is just some other, well, let me change colors here. This is just some other function. We're saying that if I take, say, phi bar of four, that should be equal to phi of zero, which is zero. So this element maps to this element. And if I take phi bar of one, oops, one plus four, that's going to give me phi of one, which is one. So this element maps to this element. And again, phi bar of two plus four, is going to be phi of 2, which is 2, and phi bar of 3 plus 4, I keep forgetting the other bracket, gives me phi of 3, or 3. So we can see that this is the isomorphism. We can see which elements map to which other elements, and we can see that they would, in fact, be isomorphic, that they would behave in the same way. What we just went through, the example that we just went through, actually used this theorem that says the mapping phi from z to z sub n defined by phi of m is equal to m mod n is a homomorphism with kernel of the cyclic subgroup generated by n. And then by the first isomorphism theorem that z mod the cyclic subgroup divided by n is isomorphic to z sub n. So again, we just looked at this in our last example. We had phi mapped z to z sub 4, and we went through all of the work to show that, in fact, that z mod the cyclic subgroup generated by 4 was isomorphic to z4. Another thing we know is that if phi is a homomorphism from a finite group g to g bar, then the order of g, um, sorry, the order of phi of g divides the order of g and of g bar. So this just follows from the first isomorphism theorem, um, the fact that phi of g is a subgroup of g, and Lagrange's theorem that says any subgroup of g has to divide the order of the group. Let's finish up with two related questions. We're starting with phi is a homomorphism from g to h. So we've got G mapping to H by phi. And we have sigma is mapping H to K, mm, sigma, from H to K. And we want to show, and those are both homomorphisms, and we want to show that sigma phi is going to be also a homomorphism going from G to K. So that's what we're trying to show. Now, the same way that we've shown homomorphisms in the past is to take whatever our function is, in this case, sigma phi, of two elements. We'll call them g1, g2. So we have to say, let g1, g2 be elements of g. So we have to show that that is going to be the same. So we're showing us operation preserving of sigma phi g1 sigma phi g2. That's what we're trying to show. What to show. All right, so let's show it. 
And we'll start with sigma phi g1, g2, which we know because it's just composition of functions, I can write it just like this, phi g1, g2, because that's what composition of functions tells us to do. Now, phi is a homomorphism. Therefore, based on the fact that phi is a homomorphism, just as what I'm trying to show shows operation preserving, I already know phi is a homomorphism, so I can rewrite phi g1, g2 as phi g1 and phi g2. And because sigma is a homomorphism, I can rewrite what I have here as sigma phi g1, sigma phi g2. And that's exactly what I wanted to show. And therefore, it is, in fact, a homomorphism. So now let's talk about the kernel of phi and the kernel of sigma phi. How are they related? How can I write their index? Well, what I know is that the order of g mod kernel phi is equal to h. The order of h mod kernel phi is equal to g and the order of g mod kernel sigma phi is actually related, I mean, sorry, is actually equal to k. So if I'm trying to find the index of kernel of sigma phi to kernel phi, well, this is just going to be the order of the kernel of sigma phi, whoops, sigma phi divided, too many lines, divided by the order of kernel phi. So what does that give me? That gives me the order of h divided by the order of k. So I'm using these two. I just threw that in there just for fun. Up next, we're moving on to chapter 11, the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups.